Okay, welcome to today's webinar on organizing people with databases. And uh, exciting today is we've got some special guests, Phil Evans and Bess Murphy. Uh, Bess, um, would you like to introduce yourselves, please? Up to you, Bess. Um, hi everyone, my name's Bess. I live in Cairns in Far North Queensland and I work at the Cairns and Far North Environment Centre, which is a um, small environment nonprofit up here. Um, we've been pushing for change and fighting the fight for 40 years next year. So we started out with the fight for the Dane Tree. Um, anyway, we've um, just sort of had some revolutions in our database in the last couple of years. Um, so I'm keen to share some of that with you all. Yeah. Cool. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Phil Evans. I um, am coming at you from the land of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation where sovereignty has never been ceded and I wanna pay my respects to elders past and present. You probably can hear my dog barking in the background, Zane or Freddie. Um, I work for Friends of the Earth um, and we've been um, going through a very long revolution of using a um, CRM or a client or customer relations management system um, called Nation Builder for a few years um, and through that work um, I now um, administer 16 databases um, across grassroots networks and I also do a radio show on 3CR on Tuesday mornings at 9.30 a.m. 5.5 a.m. if you're in Melbourne or you can jump online and listen to it called Dirt Radio. Gratuitous plug for my radio show, The End. <laughs> okay, beautiful. So I'm just going to start by sharing screen um, and just show you something. Um, I've been running a few webinars on strategy um, during this uh, series. And one thing that I've banged on quite a lot about is the central node concept. Um, and so basically we've got um, all the ways of getting um, people to come across your campaign, um, to get involved in your campaign. And then how do we move them up the ladder and up the pathways? And what's central to that is databases. And uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this is really important webinar because there's really hard, like all the people that are actually um, good at this stuff is still finding it hard and people who are new to this uh, find it extremely difficult. So we're hoping to do a few more of these type of webinars, um, but yeah, it's really important that we're um, talking about this stuff. So just to introduce a little bit about what, uh, uh, what we mean by da databases. So the industry jargon is a CRM, and that comes from a business con uh, uh, concept called customer relationship management or client relationship management. So sometimes we'll use the word constitution or um, you know, other anagrams to stick in there. But basically it's about managing the relationships with people. And specifically, what we'd really like to do is facilitate them taking action because we're trying to change the world and we've got a plan and we want to help people along with our vision um, to get them to help save the world. And there's various ways of doing that. And we also want to communicate um, with people, communicate with our followers and our supporters and also to the bigger world. Uh, and also there's some really specialized subsets to um, a client relationship manager and sometimes they'll have different terms and different um, approaches. So for example, a donor management system. So there are quite a few sub systems or sub approaches to the actual CRM concept. Uh, so we're generally, today we're just gonna go overview of all the basic concepts and things to think about. And then on Friday's webinar, we're gonna get into some nitty gritty with actual specific systems. So, um, the, if you're new to Zoom, which is unlikely in the COVID environment, we have down here the chat um, window. So that means that you can uh, talk to other participants. So you may want to share some resources or ask some questions. We've also got the Q&A, which is specifically for questions. So if your question's on topic, we'll probably answer it in context. If it's sort of off topic, then we'll have time after the webinar to answer any questions. So please answer, uh, ask questions um, and that would be great. Okay, why? Why are we doing this? So why would a uh, not-for-profit and NGO actually want to uh, do the work and the complexity uh, and the, the boring work sometimes of implementing a CRM? 
Well, it's a key tool in scaling. If you want to grow your campaign, you want to get bigger, you want to be more effective, then this is the key tool that we're using in contemporary organizing. It's also been proven effective. Uh, in looking at the big movements of recent years, they're all based on data-driven systems. Um, and so there's heaps of data and stats on that. User expectations is also important. So for example, I had a friend and an NGO email, uh, posted them two letters about a campaign to the same address. And they got really upset about that. And they were, they were like, this is wasting resources and things like that. Um, and they were expecting that that organization was smart enough to understand that there was two supporters at that one address. Um, and they didn't quite understand that that's actually complex and hard. So users are expecting you to be a lot more um, smarter with your data. And also competition. And an unfortunate thing that's happening in, a, in the Australian context and I assume global is this competition for funding, competition for uh, attention, competition generally. And although a lot of not-for-profits and people within not-for-profits are trying to break that down, if you don't um, start using these new modern ways of organizing, someone else will, and they'll just um, take you out, so to speak, or just out drown your message. So we want to um, first, the, always the first place to start is as having a strategy. So over to Phil. Sure. So hopefully when you um, have even gotten to the point of thinking about getting um, some sort of CRM or database system going, you've already doing it in context of a campaign strategy. So your campaign strategy is your series of goals and objectives and tactics in the pathway of how you're going to get to whatever it is that you're trying to do. So embedded within your campaign strategy as well is a theory of change or how you think change happens in society. So it may be um, a matter of that only by operating outside of the establishment um, through a series of direct action or um, disruptive uh, interruptions that you might be able to affect change or it may be in track so um, where you might want to uh, work within a system to do it but it's how are you going to get people to do some sort of action or to do things to make change happen so that's really important things to think about before you even get to the point of a CRM and embedded within that campaign strategy itself is your digital strategy or how you're going to use online tools to do the work that you do, once again, in context of that theory of change. So the question is then, what do we want people to do and how are you going to support them to do that? Because when we use a database, what we want to do is figure out how we're going to facilitate people to take those actions and how we're going to communicate with them that this is the right time to do it. So thinking about our campaign strategy, um, what are the tactics that we need to deploy? What is it that we want our supporters to do? And when is the right time to do it? Because it's a critical point in a campaign. So what we're really talking about uh, when we talk about databases, for me, is people. So we're talking about tracking relationships that we have with supporters or um, with our members and understanding who are they to us? What do they want to do? And what have they put their hands up to do or have done? So for instance, you could have volunteers or people who come in and help you with tasks, people who take actions. So people who may have signed a petition or attended a rally or gone and locked themselves onto machinery to stop it. Um, they may be a donor, someone who's given some money or resources of some sort to support your campaign. They may be a sponsor, someone you're partnering with, may it be a business or another organization. Um, they might be an attendee to an event, like an information session, movie nights. Um, it may be a member of your organisation, if you're a membership organisation. And I can tell you, as someone who's worked in membership, without some sort of good CRM system, it is very hard to track memberships. Um, and it may also be a media contact. So someone who um, is out there who's able to amplify your message, whether that be mainstream media, citizen journalism, or um, just an online presence. So when we're thinking about these relationships, what we're talking about is really understanding what is the pathway of action that is happening uh, for, the, for the supporter or the user. So, Previously, I know Glenn has done a wonderful uh, seminar on user pathways. and I've just put a link in the chat 
just now. So if you want to go and check that out and find out more detail, you can see some of those um, great resources that Glenn put up um, in his shared screen um, earlier. And I'll put a link to those resources. Whoa, I lost my mouse in the chat right now. So a user pathway is the steps that someone is going to take on a journey with you in order to affect the change that you want to see or to progress your campaign strategy. So a good CRM should make it possible to see where any given supporter is up to on that supporter pathway. And your website should be set up in a way to facilitate supporters to take steps in that pathway or at least inform them how they can do so. So whether it be a digital action or whether it be something IRL or in real life that they can do. So important to this, um, as Glenn showed up on the screen earlier, is that central node concept. So if you're unfamiliar with that, do jump back and check out one of the other um, action skills webinars where you can uh, find out more information about that. I'm trying to think, what are we doing here? Um, so when we're doing, when a good CRM will also capture data uh, when people are taking steps along that user pathway. So um, that may be something that happens on social media. Um, although um, post Cambridge Analytica, a lot of CRMs have disconnected themselves from automated data captures from social media. Check it out, Google Cambridge Analytica. Um, there's data at person at, at a real life event. So just because something is happening out of the digital realm doesn't mean it doesn't go into your database. So thinking about sign up sheets and things like that and getting them into your database. Or there is of course the online action. So we've all probably clicked through and signed an online petition, but often people don't ask why. So yes, we can pay table petitions still in parliament and ask friendly MPs or um, even get citizens to go in and do that themselves. But often the reason why we sign a launch a petition is to da harvest data, uh, which sounds like a nefarious term, but I like to think of my database as a garden, so it works for me. So what that really is about is throwing out a net and trying to gauge what sort of interest lies out in the community on my issue and also who are the people who are interested in it and prepared to act. Because effectively, if your user pathway stops at a digital petition, you're probably working for an organisation that I won't mention right now. Um, and that's the end of the, the pathway for them. And does that fit your theory of change? Does that fit into your campaign strategy? These are the things that you need to ask yourself. Um, also, it's important in the user pathway to think about how communication works in that. So how are you going to talk to the users as they go through? And what's the next step in their journey? And what needs to happen next for them to do that? So if you are unfamiliar with that user pathways, do check out that webinar from Action Skills and um, catch up on it. But it's an important part of planning out how you're going to do your CRM. Do you want to tell us a little bit about tech, Glenn? Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the tech. So we've been talking about strategy and we always will start with good strategy because tech is only a tool. And it's it, because it, it is complicated, um, but it can really help increase scale. So it's really important to understand that this is not magic. Um, I come to a lot of people and go, Glenn, can you make me a website? And we're magically going to win the campaign. Like there's no magic here. Um, although I may want to pretend so it's, it's actually a process and it's actually hard work. Um, and ideally you work smarter than harder with a good strategy. So some really important points to think about when we're talking about databases. The first one is there is no perfect tool. Um, there's two reasons for that. One is that there's just the people who are building these tools. They're only recent technology. They've only been accessible for the last maybe 10 years ish. Um, so they're, they're still working on it. The other thing as well is your theory of change and your actual strategy is the same, but different to other organizations. So therefore the tools are same, but different. And so therefore they don't quite exactly fit. Um, so some uh, tools, some CRMs are really good at some things, but they may not be good at other things. Some tools may do a bit of everything well, but not anything really well. So at that point, you need to work out what will work for you. There's some really simple tools and some very complex tools. So it's important to understand if you don't have um, much resources in your organization, 
you don't have many staff, then there's no point having a complex system that require that would produce more results, but you don't actually have the resources to run it. Or if you're using mostly volunteers, then you definitely want a simple system because you're going to need to train and upskill and manage and make sure that they don't mess that up. You also need to think about lock-in. And lock-in is really interesting. So this is where you're stuck with the system um, and you can't move out. So there's two ways, uh, two ways of looking at lock-in. One is that you've invested so much time and effort into getting to this point that you're just not going to do that again for the next five years. So that, 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 and that happens a lot with CRMs. Because it takes a lot of work and effort, you're just simply, I'm not changing. The other is that some systems will do tricks to sort of lock you in. You can't export certain data. Um, you're locked in. To can't integrate with certain systems, etc. Generally, the not-for-profit space is pretty good with this. Um, however, you can use commercial uh, CRMs in the not-for-profit context, and a lot of big, big CRMs such as Salesforce do offer um, free versions for not-for-profits. So just make sure you're checking in that sort of lock-in. Um, now, the nature of CRMs, um, uh, I actually forgot about what I was going to talk to that point, so I'll skip it. Um, this stuff is um, really quite technical. So if you're searching for something a little bit more complex, then you will need to get some help with it. Um, if, if you've either got the budget for that, or you'll need to do some learning, or you'll keep it simple. And some CRMs just work out, out of the box. So what that means is that when you first sign up, it's sort of set up roughly how you need it. Um, so MailChimp would be an example of that. And then you can just start using it. Other systems require a lot of customization. So uh, Salesforce, for example, is an extremely powerful tool, but it requires a lot of customization to set it up to, to get it to what, you're, what you need it to be. Okay, so there's a few different um, technical approaches to how CRMs uh, are implemented. So the most common one is called the cloud. You may have heard that jargon. Or another way of looking at it is software as a service, SaaS. So basically what this means is that somebody else or the company that runs the service is hosting it. They're, um, and we've done previous webinars on web tech, so you can check them out. Um, so they're hosting it, they're securing it, they're looking up, up after upgrades. They're, they basically provide the service and you pay a rental fee. That also means that you can access that system anywhere that you can access the internet. And this has proven to be the more superior approach and most systems now work on that. Um, versus, you know, running a system in your office, for example. Some systems are what we call off the shelf and that just means that they work off the shelf. So you buy the system and then away you go. Some systems require quite a bit of customization to do what they need to do. Um, so you need to sort of ask these questions of what sort of work is this tool realistic? And generally in their sales um, process, they'll, they'll overemphasize how simple things are and um, underestimate how complexity works. So you're gonna to need to get your hands a bit dirty and work out how their complexity is going to work for you. Um, and another approach to CRMs, and this is more common with bigger organizations or bigger campaigns, i.e. they've got the technical capability and the funding to do this, is a hybrid system. So earlier we mentioned that some systems are better than others at certain things. So what, they, what some groups will do is they'll grab that system that's really good at donations and this system that's really good at donor management and this system that's really good at uh, managing people and pathways and then they'll mix them up and get them talking to each other. Um, so Greenpeace, for example, uh, has a very complex mishmash of technologies from many years of um, technological upgrades. Um, but then that requires money and skills to keep that system running. Okay, so now we want to, now we've acknowledged that this is actually complex. It's really important to actually understand what you want to do before you start looking into these complexities. And so over to Bess um, and to talk about tech briefing and why we should do this. Hi, so I guess tech briefing is the next step beyond um, what Bill was talking about, where you know, you're thinking about your overall um, campaign strategy and theory of change. Um, then you take those concepts and then you go to the nitty gritty with your tech briefing. Um, tech briefing is something that 
I can tell everyone that they should do because I tried to start a project like this without doing it. And lo and behold, it was unsuccessful. <laughs> um, it's, it's really about thinking about all of the detail of what you would want out of a CRM. So you actually know what you're looking for when you're comparing them because it's really overwhelming when you start looking at the different companies or the different little bits and bobs um, that they offer to kind of digest it all if you yourself don't know exactly what you want out of your database. Um, you need to spend time doing it. Um, it's something that's really worth spending time on. Um, to break down, um, break down your problem that you have, you're trying to solve, um, which is often quite complex, um, really into bite-sized chunks of um, all, a list of all the things that you want. Um, and as Glenn said um, before, none of these CRMs are perfect. So you have to go into it knowing that you are going to make compromises um, on your list and your tech briefing, um, which is why you need to um, make it hierarchical. Um, so when you're, right? Sorry, it just was muting me for some reason. Did you hear that? Okay. Um, so um, you want it to be hierarchical. So when you make your list, um, what are things that you must have? What are you things that you couldn't survive without? What are the things that you would like to have? And what are the things that are nice to have? Because um, it's likely that um, unless you're a really big org, you're probably not gonna have enough money and time to have all the things all at once. Um, maybe you can, but I haven't found it to be the case. Um, another thing um, on your tech briefing is um, to really bring everyone in in your organization or group um, that you're working with to see what they need. Um, for example, in our organization, we are a member organization um, and I found it so valuable to sit down with um, our office manager who's been here for 15 years, who's been running the membership that whole time. And there were so many different angles um, that I hadn't even thought about in the way that she currently processes um, our data um, that would have been vital to what we had to and not maybe didn't need to have. Um, so definitely do your consulting. Um, do make sure you've got um, a realistic budget of what you can afford because um, that'll obviously um, chop out some options for you um, and then you can go into doing research. Um, so it's really about making sure you've got your brief um, and it's really clear and detailed kind of before you start browsing around, I'd say. Um, yeah, ask for advice. Um, there's so many people using different tools, um, you know, like today we're, and on Friday, we're gonna go over a few different types, um, but really get onto people and, um, and ask them about how they use the tools and, you know, make sure you're trying to identify differences between your different groups um, that might cause red flags for why or why not something wouldn't work for you. Um, and I think as well, just going back to that, in asking people for advice um, and having a good brief, it's really important to do that, um, I guess, before you dive into just having a trial on something. Um, because it's if you just go in and have a trial and you don't know what you want to do, you're not going to find out much from it. Um, and you're probably going to take you a lot longer to figure out what you don't need. Um, I think that's really the last couple of things, I guess, um, as well in your tech briefing, thinking about how easy it needs to be used, um, how easy it needs to be for your, um, people in your group that you're working in with, um, if you've, you're working part of a, um, a group of, um, fellow nerds who are trying to you know, do something really nerdy, then you can probably go for something really sophisticated. Um, but if you're in an office with, um, you know, people from other generations and walks of life that are, you know, not digital natives or have different experiences, um, you're really going to have to think about that and having an outcome that's really accessible. The same goes for, um, you know, at our, our organisation, um, you know, you might have lots of, you might have volunteers and that sort of stuff. Are they going to use your database or not? And how easy it needs to be for them. Um, and finally, um, just thinking about what sort of training you would need um, to get people on board, which just goes on from that complexity um, one. 
for example, like some of the really complex, bigger systems like Salesforce, you would basically almost need to like pay for training, right? To like get your staff on board. And if you can't afford that, then that's that. So that's something else to think about. I think that's it. You guys got anything to add? The only thing that I'd add is that you must do a brief. Like you are just going to get a world of pain if you don't actually know what you're asking for. You're going to get all the wrong answers. Okay, so I'm just going to now talk a little bit about costs and, um, you know, these things cost money. And I just want to um, have a conversation that we had this morning when we were planning the webinar with Phil. And Phil was talking about Zapier and the cost of Zapier. And I was like, whoa, that was expensive, the, the system, this fancy system that he's built. Um, but his response was, it's far cheaper than the labour that we pay to do it. Um, not to mention valuing um, volunteers who would rather be doing um, more interesting or effective work than just admin. So when you're looking at the costs, um, some things may seem expensive, but if you actually break things down into opportunity costs, labour costs, volunteer engagement um, and retention, then sometimes these things are a lot um, simpler, uh, sorry, a lot more affordable or actually cheaper. So it's important to look at that. And uh, maybe in a, a capitalist framework, it's the, the total cost of doing the business uh, is something you need to look at, just not cost of components. And I know that a lot of um, people in organizations are resistant to putting um, CRMs in and cost is one of those. Um, however, it can really pay for themselves. Okay, so when you're looking um, obviously at the technical aspects of CRMs, it's also really important to look at the pricing models and understand where the costs are. Because sometimes they have hidden costs or maybe the costings aren't clear. So you need a tech brief because then you can have a look at all the functions and see what different things are going to be charged for. So generally these, uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the approaches to um, some things that will cost you money. Um, not all systems will charge this um, and it'll be quite different. So some uh, CRMs will charge you a monthly fee. That makes sense. And generally that's scaling on the size of your database. So if you've got a big database, they'll charge you more. But generally they'll start be doing more things about what type of interactions that you're going to do with people, specifically email and SMS. So some CRMs will charge you per number of 10,000 um, emails that you send or maybe SMSs and those sort of things. So if you're comparing systems, one that may look potentially expensive, if you're uh, communicating a lot, then it may work out cheaper to use an expensive system that's got cheaper costs for sending emails, for example. Whereas if you're intermittently only sending an email every now and then, then it would make sense to have lower monthly fees, for example. Uh, and also various interactions or maybe plugins or various components that you may need may be an extra cost. Um, so also customizations. So some CRMs will charge you to access various customizations, or maybe you'll need to pay for various customizations um, by getting say a contractor in or um, delegating time to your tech team to actually do it. You also need your website to actually integrate with your CRM. So looking back at that central node concept, your website is one of the key um, places where someone may come to your website for to look at some content and they may, you know, talk into um, donate or sign up to do an action. So how much is your website going to cost? So some CRMs such as a Nation Builder have websites built in. However, to actually customize the aesthetic and design within uh, Nation Builder requires custom coding, which is an extra cost. Whereas something like Action Network has, has a website of sorts, but it's pretty average, but you can embed that with WordPress reasonably easy. So if you can get a cheap WordPress happening, or you may again pay money for an expensive WordPress. So the cost of your website and its integration is really key. Um, thing to think about with the cost of your CRM. Uh, integration, so various things that they'll integrate with. So maybe it integrates with your accounting software. So that totally makes sense that any donation payment automatically will go into your um, accounting software. So therefore you don't have to get a volunteer to sit there and do all the boring admin. Um, now any technical system has its complexities. So therefore people will need to be trained on this. Um, 
unless you've got a super uber nerd that just can magically um, figure things out. And even then you don't want that person just figuring it out because they may not understand your setup or integration correctly. So you definitely need to spend time and maybe money on actual training. If you're using a more advanced complex system, then you'll need like advanced training with your core staff or volunteers that are running the complex parts. And generally you'll need to spend some, sparks, uh, some staff time um, managing all the volunteers running on that. And another key thing to look at is your growth and estimated growth. So if you're looking at a system that's got costs per email and you've got a small database, but you're confident you're, you're going to grow your campaign in a year, maybe, and, and we're also looking at that lock-in point, so you can't really change your CRM for another five years. What is going to be the cost of your system in two years and three years when you're growing? So you really want to start thinking about the costs and implications of growth within your um, campaign, which is a good problem to have, but it's far better to have that uh, sort of thought about before the bills start rolling in. Okay, so part of your um, briefing, so I'm just going to start now talking to some details. Um, part of your briefing is data planning. So you need to actually plan what you're going to do with data because data is a very vague word. So now we're going to start narrowing in a bit to some details about what, what we mean about data. So the first point is personalization. So for example, when you get an email, um, so hopefully the email that I sent out to you said, hello, your first name. Now that just is common manners and sort of, it's just a nice thing to have a personalized email. So for example, for me to send that email, I need to have your first name. Now you can have an anonymous first name or a um, fake first name, that's totally fine, but then you'll get your nickname, hello, your nickname, which is totally fine as well. So there's other personalizations that um, are also important, obviously the email, um, but maybe the people have certain preferences. So when we work on the CAFTEC database, we wanted people to be able to subscribe to various campaigns within CAFTEC so they could only just get uh, stuff on the marine campaign and not the forest campaign, for example. So you're more likely to get people to stay with your database if you're not, not sending email every five minutes. And if they're really interested in the marine, they may just want to make sure they just get the marine email, for example. We also, and back to the pathways uh, that Phil was talking about, is that how do we empower people? So how do we have in our data design ways to empower them? to show where they are on their pathways. So for example, we might pull up all the people that have um, taken a certain amount of actions, but then haven't come to an event, for example. And then we may work out a way to say, well, how do we get this group of people to actually come to an event? And maybe we send them personal emails or some other strategy. Another key uh, thing you wanna look at with your planning is what problems do you need to solve? So we're talking at a base level, we wanna send email to people but you may have other um, things that are unique to your campaign. So for example, how would you contact people that don't use the internet? That would be an interesting one. Um, so what sort of, how would you solve that, that problem with a CRM? So one thing would be to try to get postal addresses, for example. And we wanna work out how are we using that data? Um, is it simply that we're going to um, use that to send email? Or are we actually going to be putting the, do the donor details and then we're going to actually get a volunteer to go through and ring up everybody and then they might have the previous conversations that they've had with them. So instead of ringing up going, oh, can we have some money? They could ring up and say, oh, we've noticed that you've, you know, you've signed up to some, some, some um, events. Um, you've donated two years ago. Um, we're just checking in to see um, how would you like, um, you know, how are we going and how can we help you? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Obviously, you'd write a better script than that, but I mean that would be really helpful if you're running a, a, a core campaign, for example. So, um, if you if you need that sort of data, then that needs to go into your data planning. Um, how are you um, communicating with your people? And how you're rallying them and calling them to act? So the studies have shown that SMS gets a far um, better uh, result in some audiences. Um, some people just don't use email. So in that context, you need a plan. But if you send an SMS to your audience every five minutes, they're going to disconnect really quickly. So you may have a plan to say, look, we're going to send email once a week. 
And then when there's a really important thing we want them to do, we'll send them an SMS. We need to also look about what data do we need. And I'll talk a little bit about data privacy uh, in a little bit. Um, but what are the minimum we need? So to send a personalized email, we need the email address and we need their first name. We might actually not need anything else. Um, generally, if it's going to be anything location-based, then we may want to get their postcode or at least their state. So then we can go, okay, so it's a Queensland campaign. So therefore we can send one email to the locals so that we can um, target that information. And then we want to send one just to the rest of the country. So generally that's um, some of the minimal data that we need. Um, however, depending on your strategy and what you're doing, there may be huge amounts of data sets that you, you may want from people. Um, donation data is generally a useful one as well. Um, and that leads us to segmenting data. So this is planning on how we're going to have um, different categories and to segment data into different ways. So I mentioned state before, so that's a, an obvious one. Um, doing various actions where they are on pa certain pathways. Maybe you could tag them. So the example of the marine people that are interested in the marine campaign. So we can segment them marine. So that way, if we've got a marine based email, we can just send straight to that list. So in my webinar list, I have my general list and then I've got segmented the webinar people. So I only send the invites to the webinar to the people who have tagged webinar. So I don't annoy the rest of my list that don't care about webinars. Now I have sent two emails to the whole list to say, one say, hey, here's an update. We've, um, we've been running webinars, do you wanna get involved? And I sent an update yesterday to say, we've got some two exciting ones today. Um, so I'm using this, the segmentation there. And that's more about having respect for people. Um, okay, data growth. So managing data is a bit like managing a garden, as Phil used the analogy before. And it gets very overgrown and full of weeds and um, messy. And so how do you um, manage the growth of your data? If you have hyper complex data structures and designs, then that can be really hard when you've got um, volunteers that aren't trained so well to, or if you've got more of a, a anarchist group to have agreement, or if you've got independent volunteers, they may be starting to use tags that don't make sense. And then you've got all these different um, approaches to data. So when you go to use that data, it's sort of a bit like, well, this doesn't make sense to me. So that's also another really important reason why you need to do your data planning. Uh, another thing is, do you actually have the resources to use the segmentation? I was doing some data planning with an organization and they had this really long complex system of how they wanted to segment data, but they didn't have any volunteers and one staff member. They weren't actually ever gonna be able to use any of this segmentation. Um, you know, if you've got really high, really specific segmentation, that usually reflects that you've got a lot of volunteers or staff that are actually going to be able to call everyone on the specific tag um, to talk to them on a specific conversation. If you don't have those resources, it doesn't make sense. So the action skills, I'm not segmenting much at all because I don't have the resources to actually use the segmentation. Um, now before using, uh, before you sign up or before you're using a, um, CRM, you need to do an order of all the data that you have. So there's some other places where you may have data. So you may have a MailChimp here, you may have a sign up form there, you may have um, a donation Raisley somewhere. Um, so for example, in Action Schools, I've actually run a few Raisley campaigns and I, I'm yet to pull that data into my database where they've agreed to actually be contacted and I'm not actually contacting them. So, um, and we'll talk about consent next but in that context if people are consenting to talk to you then it's um, you need to work out like where's that data and then how are you going to get it into a format to import it into your um, CRM and then now a really boring um, uh, point is data hygiene and that's a um, jargon term but basically it's talking about the concept that only clean data is useful. If you've got out of date data, data that's incorrect, data that's um, segmented in all weird and wonderful ways, the data becomes useless. It becomes just a mess. So in that case, you need to spend time cleaning that data, maybe pulling out the spam and um, fixing up the addresses and resegmenting it. That takes a lot of work and time and is usually tedious and boring work. 
So ideally, you would have, it feels like, yay, this is fun. Um, but ideally, you would have, um, you would actually have a decent plan and you would manage it consistently. Um, now, I may be a little bit condescending on that. It's such an important, important role. So if we are asking volunteers to do that, like it's with huge amount of respect because um, dirty data is not very useful. Um, data is only useful if it's um, in a clean format and that's actually accurate and can be used. So that's why you want to do your data planning to make sure your data stays relevant and accurate and clean. Okay, so now I'm going to look at some of the other um, sides of things. And this is some rules. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. I love quoting Spider-Man. Um, and that's the same thing. Like these systems are, um, give, are powerful. And um, so therefore, it's really important to follow a set of rules and it's important to set a set of ethics. So the first and foremost is consent. So it's really important that you only put people on your database that have consented to be on your database. So they would need to have signed up to a petition and said, yes, you can email me. They've given you your phone number, given you their phone number with Express to use it. So um, don't ever sell and trade databases. Um, buying data, there are databases where people have actually opted in to be bought and sold, but that's a bit, whatever. So always when you've got your sign up forms and you're doing um, various data harvesting that you're making sure you get clear uh, consent. It's really important also to be transparent with what you're doing with your data. Um, so for example, you don't want to um, collect data to say you're going to be on my newsletter and then you're using it in another context. Um, so generally you're going to need a privacy policy and you're gonna think about in your organization, how you're gonna use people's data. So you might say, we're gonna segment you and send you a specific email on Marine um, after you've signed up. And you'll say, we're storing your data here, and um, this is how we're planning on using it. Um, it's really key to have a, if you're using data, to have a privacy policy, be transparent with how you're using data, making sure you have consent. Because if someone doesn't want to be on your list, then they're the wrong people anyway. So like you just don't want to be flogging a dead horse, so to speak, because um, they don't want to be there. You don't want them to be there. Um, and also make it really easy for people to unsubscribe. And that's one of the really good things at CRMs is you can just see unsubscribe. So make sure you have the unsubscribe buttons there. The um, one thing that we really need to look at um, as activists is the ethics around data. And there's a lot of um, ethics, and this is actually something that me and Phil talk about a lot, and it is a struggle. Like we're building databases of people, of activists. There's, there's some dodgy ethics just to us doing that. Um, but on the other hand, we're building databases to create change and to offset the issues. Um, so Digital Privacy Watch, an organization, they're um, campaigning the government about dodgy uses of data, but they're building databases. Um, so it's really important to to start talking about the ethics of data, how we're using it, and what type of databases we're building. There's also Australian law. So if you run to the run sheet, um, could you could one of you share that to the Zoom webinar? Sorry, I usually share that at the start of my webinars. So I've got some links there to Australian law, and there's quite a lot of um, laws um, and responsibilities that you must adhere to. Um, I'm not a lawyer. My understanding is that not-for-profits come under the commercial laws. Um, something like if you're under three million dollars, if you're over three million, then you've got a, you've got all this compliance and systems that you need to adhere to. My recommendation is you do that anyway. Back to the ethics, um, you should be running um, a very strict um, way of doing doing your data. Um, and so I've got two links there. One is the government link uh, with all the laws. And then also there's one called Justice Connect, which is a not-for-profit that looks at all this stuff. And they've got a heap of information and resources about privacy and managing data. So I think it's really important that you um, have a look at some of these resources and at least get your head around a little bit about it. And if you're unsure, don't do it. If you're feeling a bit dodgy, don't do it. Or if you're like, how would I feel if someone had my data and was doing this with it? How would you feel about that? And if you're like, well, I signed up to get marine um, emails, that's exactly what I want. 
then that's exactly, that's a really good thing. All right, so um, now I'm gonna maybe talk about so, so a little bit more about data and the use and abuse of data. And one of the, the, the first really sinister uses of databases in, in history was the IBM, International Business Machines, which is an American corporation, was providing data punch machines to the Nazis. They were providing the, the, the hardware, but also they were going to the concentration camps and actually maintaining these systems. And what that allowed the Nazis to do is to build databases of people, whether they're, they're Jewish, gay, um, misfits, anarchists, gypsies, all the things that we know for the Nazis. So that is a prime example of how databases can be used. So I think it's really important as activists that we don't forget the power of misuse of databases. Okay, so in the context though, you aren't always in control of your data. Uh, oh, sorry, just on that point as well on the abuse is that the uh, government, Australian government, the US government and around the world are building databases on people. So if you're building databases and then the government can access that, you're actually helping with those database building. So um, acknowledge the fact that government um, can access it and that you're part of that system. Okay, so for example, um, your CRM, so Action Network, Nation Builder and all those, have their own privacy policies. Any tool that you use has their own privacy policies. If you're, uh, I've got people's names on a Google document, then Google has their own privacy policies. Any system that you use that manages data has their own privacy policies. So it makes sense to actually read those privacy policies and um, see uh, what you think about them. So Facebook, for example, if you're using a Facebook pixel to track your interactions, um, for Facebook advertising, they have their own privacy policies. So it's really important on your privacy policy to actually acknowledge that, to say, we use Action Network, here's their privacy policy. We use Facebook, um, here's their privacy policy. We use Google tracking analytics, here's their privacy policy. So have a think about where all your data is being used and what other um, organizations. You can't really do much about the privacy policy of Facebook, but at least you can either choose not to use Facebook or if you do acknowledge that people's data are being used in that way. Another interesting thing to understand is where are their databases stored? So a prime example of this is the Australian Medi Medicare records are stored on a US database. Now, if you look into American law, specifically the espionage law, American government has the right to access data of a foreign national on data that's stored in the US. So to translate that, that means that legally the go American government has access to any data from a foreign entity on their data. So we, had, the Australian government has just handed over to the American government, everybody's Medicare records. Like at what point is that a decision that should have been made? So different databases uh, where it's physically located has different, has legal implications. If, um, so that should have just simply been stored in Australia under Australian law or in another jurisdiction which has better, better laws. Uh, unfortunately, most database systems are American um, or using American systems. So generally they default to America, which are awful. So have a, a understand, also think about data in that context. Um, now governments, courts and business can access your data. So, Many, many years ago, when I first started reviewing CRMs, I, review, I actually read the privacy policy of Salesforce, specifically the Salesforce free not for profit. And I'm not sure what it's like now, but um, yep, so we'll have a, we'll have a um, break at three o'clock. Um, so at that time, they said that they own your data, they can do what they want with your data, they can sell it if they want, and they can disconnect your data without notification. So to me, those terms are simply not, workable and just I wouldn't agree to them. So um, um, in the context also I uh, talked about uh, surveillance programs can access the data but then also there's various government laws especially recent Australian laws that can access the data. Um, if there's a criminal investigation a government uh, uh, sorry a court may give warrants to access data and uh, organizations like Facebook simply sell data they sell it to other businesses and they sell it to law enforcement, for example. So um, need to also think about that with your databases. 
So that leads on to what information are you collecting? So for me, always collect the minimum amount of information that you need. Also allow anonymous um, signups. So for example, if I want to use a fake name and email address to sign up for marine emails from CAFNEC, I should be free to do that. Because I may for some reason not want the government to know that I'm interested in the marine um, campaign. So, um, and depending on the nature of what you're doing, that may not be appropriate, but always try to approach it like how can someone be anonymous or be anonymized. Um, also, make sure you don't have inappropriate segmenting. Do not tag people as arrestable. Do not tag people as radical. Do not tag people as these sort of things. This is a gold mine. Um, you know, government's gonna go, oh, thank you for tagging people like this. Um, so just don't do it. Um, always assume that unless you've got a crack security team that understands encryption and talks in mathematical nerd language that can secure your database, which no one has, I've yet to meet anyone that has that. So unless you've got that, assume that the government's accessing your database. Just make that assumption and have respect for people and use it accordingly. Um, but a little bit more um, internally is who controls the organization's database? Who is the boss of it? So for example, there is always a technical admin or multiple technical admins. So for example, if I'm the technical admin of a not-for-profit group and I just decide, well, I disagree with you now and I just shut down your systems. So what are you doing to prevent that or you know all that sort of stuff um so control of actual data is quite an important discussion you also want to look at um who has access to what in various permissions so you may have some advanced data um, that you're collecting you may have the donation history of people and that's um something that's useful and um important you know important thing but you may not want an average um, volunteer to be able to access that data or you may have the the home addresses of people maybe it's for compliance maybe it's to send them snail mail but you also just don't want random um, volunteers that you may may not be able to vet as thoroughly as we'd like um, could access people's addresses like why they may have no need for that so therefore you would actually set that in your database that they can't access that, for example. So it's also really important to actually have rules and agreements in, internally with the organization. So um, that's talking about a lot of the things I'm talking about, respect, access, um, sharing data, leaking data, um, segmenting, all that. So you're making it very clear how people in your organization actually use the data and the respect that they need to give to that data. And also some of the legal ramifications of that. Um, and it's really important to give your people, your users or the people in your database, the right to access that data and the right to delete it. So that's also another um, important point when you're talking about inappropriate segmenting is that you should assume that you'll give that data to someone if they ask. So if you've tagged them as, you know, radical and um, um, this and that, like you should give them that data if they ask for it. Um, and they should have the right to be deleted from all systems. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about integration before our break. Um, so one of the key uh, things in integrating your um, website, integrating your CRM is integrating it within your website. So I'm just gonna talk really briefly about this. Um, in the advanced WordPress um, webinar, if you're using WordPress, I talked in detail about how to integrate different CRMs into WordPress. Um, so the first approach is say nation builder users is that the CRM comes with a website. Uh, MailChimp, for example, now is um, producing a website that you could use if using MailChimp. So you may get that as part of your CRM. You may have an external website and then you need to get the two to talk together. So for example, my Action Skills website, I have um, my Action Network, so on Action Skills, I have my Action Network forms on a WordPress website that then directly talk to that. Um, or you may use external tools to get them to talk. So you may use a Zapier or you may actually just download data. So for example, you may run a Raisley and it may be just quicker and easier to just download the data in a CSV and then import that data into your database. So um, I'll just 
going over that quite briefly. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about fundraising and processing money, I guess, through your CRM. Um, so we want to have a good payment system and donation system so that we can fund all our campaigning to change the world. Um, so, yeah, um, it's really great, um, I can say, from going from a payment system and donation system that was very much unautomated um, to one that's pretty much automated and it saves so much time. And like we were talking about before, um, you know, it's all about how much time are you spending, you know, processing things, writing receipts, that sort of stuff. Um, if you can get your CRM to do it automatically, then that's amazing. And most of them do. Um, so we've just got a couple of points, I guess, things to think about in that regard. Um, you know, how a different, like the kind of payments that a different system can process. Um, for example, on Raisley, they, um, it's basically, it's a fundraising um, platform mostly. So, to do payments that aren't associated, um, that have tax in, within them as well, means you have to fiddle around a bit. So that's something to think about um, if you are an organisation that has charity status. Um, that's something to think about. Um, what kind of um, options you have? Like, can you process um, payments just with credit card? Can they do, um, you know, bank transactions on your website? That sort of stuff. Can you process um, monthly donations um, really easily? Um, you know, monthly donations power a lot of groups and organisations and giving that, that long-term funding that you can rely on. So for us, it was really important that we could find a system that could manage that and just, you know, automatically receipt people each month or whenever you want it to and make sure those donors um, can get their, get their receipts. Um, Whoa, where are we? Oh yeah, cash and bank transfers. So um, while it's great to have a system that can automate, um, you know, people can go onto your website um, and they can make a donation and that can, information can go into your CRM, um, then what about other payments? Like say you're getting cash on your stalls, you might get a donation of cash on your stalls, or maybe you'll get a bank transfer straight into your bank account. How can you take that data and make sure that it gets into your CRM and it doesn't get lost? Um, you know, we can automate a lot of things, but there's still um, lots of little bits of data and information like that, that it's good to think about how you're gonna capture it and use it. Um, and receipt it as well. So with your bank transfers and that sort of stuff, um, how do you know that one's come in? Like, are you gonna be able to give them a receipt and do you have someone looking to check that it's there or can you pick that up? Um, there's lots of different elements to it. Um, keeping, oh, what was next? Oh yeah, receipts and compliance. Um, this is something that I've sort of figured out over time I had to get a lot better at. Um, <laughs> what you, if somebody gives you money, then you need to receive them. Um, and if you are an organization that can have, um, that has charity status, so you have that DGR status and it's a tax deductible donation, there's actually a lot of little extra bits and bobs that you need to make sure goes into your receiving that um, you know, doesn't automatically come out and the automatic receipts um, in a lot of those databases. So making sure that you're really covered um, for your particular organization's needs in that respect and making sure you're doing that all. Um, oh, retention and appreciation of donors. Um, does your CRM have tools that, um, you know, once you get donations, you can actually say thank you or get in touch with them. We all know that, um, you know, donor journeys are as important as campaign journeys. Um, we have to make sure that the people who support us are really getting supported back. Um, and I think that looking at your fundraising tools within your CRM to make sure that you're going to be able to easily do that is vital um, because I think that it's something that a lot of us are really good at, um, especially when you don't have a good system to support you doing it. Um, you know, another thing is thinking about using that data um, 
you know, if you've got an appeal coming up and you want to look at who is, um, you know, who have been your major donors in the last few years, who's given you the most money or, you know, that sort of thing, like you might want to be able to get in touch with them to see if they're going to support you again um, and making sure that you're actually capturing that data and you're able to search for it. Um, members. Um, this is a fun one. Um, we are a membership organisation <laughs> and it found it quite tricky to kind of find a solution um, for membership. Um, even today, just on my 10 minute break, I was in the other room talking with Mari, our office manager, about getting the right segment for a mail out with our, some people in our new system and some people in the old system and it's a journey. Um, membership is, um, yeah, I suppose everyone has a different forms of membership, but in my experience, most of the CRMs aren't designed naturally to accommodate it. Um, so thinking about how you're going to process those payments and that sort of thing. We do our membership through Raisley, um, but I've had to do a lot of fiddling um, to make that really work for us, um, especially, like I said before, around receipting and tax and that sort of thing because membership's not a donation it's a fee for service i mean other tools that could be in there peer-to-peer -peer, um can you do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising with your tools um some people really like to do those i don't like them that much but <laughs> i think i think they work for some people um and we go merch we've got merch and snail mail as our last stop point i think i was talking about um you know if you're selling stuff on your website right um and how you can actually get that out to your supporters um you know if you've got a shop on your website that sort of thing um how are you actually getting their proper postal addresses and getting that out to them um is another aspect I just wanted to add to that. Um, a lot of um, crowd funders uh, these days have um, like um, rewards, various types of rewards. So, you know, you might get a sticker pack if you donate 20 bucks. If you donate 40 bucks, you get a t shirt, that sort of stuff. So, you also want to be looking at how do you integrating the data and um, facilitating those side of things, assuming that that's what you're doing. Um, and I know that a lot of um, businesses and artists like to support not-for-profits, so you may be able to do a call around and get people to donate things um, as part of that. Mm, yeah. And, um, yeah, I think something that we at CAFNIC, we use the Raisley Kepler um, CRM, and Raisley is first and foremost a fundraising platform um, and not an organising platform, even though it's aspiring to become one. Um, and using those tools, the tools are really good, um, but it's all pretty automated and organised, which is great. Um, but it's really, having those good tools has made it so much easier for us to fundraise. Um, and it's just really obvious. So I'd really urge everyone to not forget that we do have to fundraise. I think it's everyone's like least favorite part. Everyone wants to go out and campaign, but um, don't forget those tools because they're so vital. Um, yeah, and on that point as well, we have a really, um, at CAFNEC, we've been around for 40 years. So unlike a lot of other organizations, um, we actually have a pretty old supporter base. We've got heaps of young people involved as well, but it means that we have a wide range of needs. Um, we have quite a few people on our database who don't have emails, um, who literally just get communication from us by, a, um, by mail. Um, so if you're going to be doing, you know, fundraising by mail or, um, you know, that sort of thing, just making sure that you can actually do that well. Um, oh yeah, and then I'm just going to quickly go over now um, email and SMS campaigns um, as a, a tool within your CRM. Um, so some CRMs have emailing tools within them, um, not um, just like separate, like a messaging tool within them. Um, and same with SMS campaigns, others don't. Um, so I suppose, again, it's something to think about what's priority for you in terms of getting it out there, um, getting your voice out there. Um, again, 
any emails and things that you can automate, do it because it will save you so much time. Um, <laughs> so much time, um, you know, membership, that sort of stuff, any donation, just eating. Um, if you can automate for all of that through your mailer, you're just going to save so much more time. Um, the SMS campaigns, I don't have too much um, to, I've only used SMS campaigns minimally so far. I've done, I've done quite a bit of um, getting people to text in. So at rallies and that sort of stuff where you can have a phone number and people can text in their details. So like as a data collection tool. Um, but in terms of using it to text people out, I don't have a lot of experience, um, but it's something that different CRMs can do. And the others might have some things to add on that. Um, yeah, um, I guess with your, anything that you're sending out, um, you know, if you're asking people to take action in your emails, hopefully you're sending them to your central node, which is collecting their data that you need and it's going straight back into your database perfectly for you, would be ideal. <laughs> um, you guys have anything else to add on that? I want to jump in on um, SMS campaigns. Yeah. It's a really powerful way, as Glenn mentioned before, in terms of engaging particular demographics. Um, remembering that um, whatever we call pre millennial Generation Z or whatever it is, I'm not even sure anymore. I don't even know what generation I am. Um, they're not necessarily on Facebook, but they um, people are like on their phones, and you just see rising, rising mm. number of people who are actually. Um, accessing their emails anyway by your phone. So going straight to SMS feels more personal. Um, but one of the things to think about is the integration back into your um, CRM. So there are um, platforms like um, Call Hub um, that um, do all of the things that um, Bess was talking about in terms of text to the rally, um, setting up phone trees and traditional tactics like that. But link back straight back into your database because Glenn really touched on an important ethical consideration around consent. Um, and it can be really easy when you start using tools and in a bit I'll talk about integration um, But when you start using tools outside of your um, CRM Because um, not a lot of the CRMs um, have texting capability as far as I know within Australia um, So you're often left using a third-party app and then making sure that you keep an honoring the consents um, that um, relate to those um, different third-party applications are really important so yeah, it can be really powerful. Yeah, and I know Raisley's introduced an SMS um, feature now as well, but I haven't played with it yet. So it'll be interesting to report back. Might do that in the next couple of days for Friday. <laughs> yeah. um, so I also just want to add a, a more simple example for automation for people who are um, you know, more beginners at this, at the webinar. Um, so an example of automation could be that they sign up on a web form and then you automatically send them an email that introduces them to the campaign, maybe some links to some background information, some other actions that they can take. And then um, you may have said in your database, if you don't hear from them in another week, send them some more information about um, and personalized content about the um, campaign or how to get involved. Um, and then you may have designed a process so that, you know, once you've set that up, then you know, the, the computer does that uh, until they actually respond. And then that may then tag someone in the database that they've responded. And then one of your volunteers can then actually be in the next level personalization. So that way, from the user's point of view, they actually get a good experience because they get emails back, they get information because they've signed up because they're keen to do something and you've just given them different ways of doing it. And, um, and then once they've got to a certain level, then they can actually have more personalized experience. So that's a more of a simple um, way of thinking about it. Um, I think that's just to gloss over a bit. And then the obvious one Bess was mentioning is to actually seat people if they donate, send an RSVP to, the, to an event, those sort of things. But you can be a lot more sophisticated with that on pathways. And uh, can I jump in there as well, Glenn? Um, a personal... Um bugbear of mine is too much automation. So there can be too much of a good thing. You gotta find that Goldilocks principle. So um, you can be too little and not support people through the pathway, but it can be too much and really turn them off. So thinking about like your audience and not thinking one size fits all. What is What are your supporters used to in terms of levels of emails? So if I sign a petition, do I need three emails? That's a good question. 
But um, some, sometimes you might get those um, number of things, but me personally, I get turned off um, when there's too much automation going on as well. So next, we're going to quickly talk about events, managing events and data from events, um, which I still haven't found perfect solution to. Um, we, when I first started working at CAFNEC, we had a website that was not connected to um, anything, any database. We had Facebook, which we were having Facebook events. Then we were duplicating Facebook events as um, Eventbrite events so that we could collect the data um, and get email addresses because you can't get email addresses from Facebook. This is before you could do that integration. So we're running three different systems. We had our event on our website, we had an Eventbrite and we had a Facebook and that was to, because there was three different reasons we needed them and we couldn't combine them. Um, and I think that's why it's really important to think about that in your brief. Um, you know, how are you gonna solve those kind of problems? If you wanna get, um, if you wanna harvest people's data um, from them signing up <laughs> to come along to events, which I certainly think you should be doing, um, then um, yeah, how are you gonna do that? How is your CRM gonna manage it? And does, um, does it have that capability? Um, same goes um, for free and paid events. Um, you know, for example, for a long time, we would just make a, events in Eventbrite for, that were free ones, but then when you had paid ones, we were like, oh crap, what do we do now? Um, can, your, can your CRM process um, payments for events through your website and the data can come in? Um, it's, a, it's a complex one. I think that there are some with good solutions, but just to make sure that you think about all those things when you're going for it. Um, and also managing RSVP, um, you know, for events to get people to come along. We really do rely on those reminders. Um, for, you know, once people have said, yes, I'm going to come, and then you remind them and you remind them, and maybe not too much or Phil will get turned off. Um, but, <laughs> you know, um, is there a way to manage your RSVPs within it or are you gonna to have to use a third party? Um, yeah, they're all things to think about. But at the end of the day, I guess you wanna see, you wanna be able to see who's coming to your events um, and you wanna be able to get in touch with them after because you're moving them along the pathway. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about it. Do you guys have much to add? No, that's really good. Um, events are really difficult. <laughs> I really agree. It seems like such a simple thing to be able to sell tickets, have two ticket levels and sell out an event, but it's never as simple as that. I mean, it's, and that's the wonderful thing around um, CRMs I find is that they can get really, uh, like um, the complexity can like start to rise really, really quickly. And like something to think about, um, randomly and I'll chuck this into the um, into the notes now and I think I'm spelling Kinefin is to check out the Kinefin framework and I'm going to quickly google that and I'll chuck it in in a bit which is like thinking about where like things go in terms of complexity anyway if you're a total nerd like me you'll love it if, if you look at it and think there's absolutely nothing for me then don't worry about it because it's probably too complex for you um, anyway, um, I'm just going to swap a little bit in the, um, the way that we laid out um, the program just to keep talking about integration because I think Bess really touched on like some of the key issues around how do I make, how do I make my database talk to everything else that I use? Just because um, I um, happen to use Nation Builder in quite a lot of the work that I do, it does do things like uh, events and sell tickets, but it's clunky ads. So being able to use a system like Eventbrite or um, one of the other ones, I can't even think what they are now, um, but having that information go into my um, database in some sort of way is really important. And there's kind of two approaches that people take to this. One is to look at, um, again, automation, and the other one is to do it via a manual process. So if you've ever done any sort of importing into a database, you'll know what a CSV is, a comma separated value spreadsheet. And you'll know how um, frustrating they can be sometimes opening them up with different programs. Um, basically, it's just a big data set with a lot of commas separating everything out, as the name suggests. 
But that's the standard format that you'll need to use um, generally with most databases to import data out. They'll give you a CSV and then you'll need to adjust the columns to make sure that the fields, the values line up and match what is inside of the place where you want to put it or your CRM. So just because you, uh, just because you um, uh, export the data from Eventbrite, if I want to put it into my action network or into my Raisley system, the data fields are going to be different. So I'm going to have to map them and sometimes do all sorts of transformations um, within Excel to make that data work. So manual data migration is any, for anyone who works in data is a headache um, and you want to avoid it as much as possible. Um, I was really happy a few years ago when I found a tool, and this is not a gratuitous plug, this just happens to be um, the tool that I'm most aware of, um, is an application called um, Zapier, or some people call it Zapier, but they do have a um, saying on their website that Zapier makes you happier. And it is true because it's an automation that allows you to use thousands of apps um, and allow them to talk to thousands of other apps through really easy um, programmable uh, zaps, as they call them, or um, little API bridges that you're building between one application and another. So if something happens, if someone buys a ticket in Eventbrite, I can set up a zap so it automatically goes straight into my nation builder and maps it right in there and all of the tags or donation amounts and things can be automatically put in. So goodbye Excel and hello Zapier, um, which is a happy thing for um, to try and avoid when you're doing that. Um, Zapier does have a free version. So if you are operating at that um, super grassroots level, that's not a barrier to not use it. However, the free version does come with limitations and it does tap out pretty quickly. Um, and there are scaled versions up right up to like super corporate plans, which um, go up into the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but make sure you just um, have a look at the pricing plans and understand, um, as Glenn was saying, with CRMs, understand the pricing structure because um, you don't want to find yourself um, tapping out and making a tool useless before you do it. So what was your brief? Thanks, Bess, for reminding me to think about that before I jump in and start using a tool. So data integration um, is pretty amazing. Um, also, um, thinking about when you're trying to do things, uh, your CRM can be really clunky. So do use those third-party apps, but think about the bridges before you start using it because you don't want to lose that data. There is nothing worse than running a campaign, running a really successful tactic, um, and then not putting that data into your database and taking them on a user journey to um, be part of your campaign strategy and reach your goals. So that stuff is really important. Um, the other one um, subject that I wanted to touch on quickly, because I think we're almost running out of time, is data reporting. Oh, we're all good. Data reporting. So when you have a database, one of the magnificent things that happens is suddenly you are flooded with so much information, um, metrics and quantitative and qualitative data um, about your organization and about the people who support it. Um, that can be overwhelming. Um, and I um, remember before Glenn was talking about like thinking about the data that you put into your database, you can create a database with all of the information in the world in it. Um, but remember that idea of data austerity and putting in only what you need because we don't need to be doing everything for the five eyes or for the government to spy on us. But what all this data does allow you to do is to understand trends and make informed decisions about what works and what doesn't work in your organization. So a classic example, I think, is when you're using uh, email software such as MailChimp or sending emails from Action Network or um, from Nation Builder or something like that, is you're going to get a bunch of uh, statistics or metrics about how many people you sent the email to, how many people opened the email, and then the clunk, the clink, the clunk, well, the, the clunk, the clunk, the click, the click through rate. <laughs> Can't even speak at the moment. The click through rate, which always is slightly more disappointing than you want it to be, let's be honest. Um, same with the open rate. But it's important to understand what emails are working for your supporters and what ones aren't. Um, because when we're doing any sort of activity, we want to think about, um, I, will, I like to think about action learning. So when I do something, I want to reflect or look at the information as it comes out. And then I want to 
do more of what works and do less of what didn't work and then keep repeating that cycle over. But there always needs to be a sense of reflection about what's going on. So when you're looking at it, you don't want to take a bit of information and say, oh, it, one time this happened, that's not really understanding a trend, that's understanding one particular moment in time. But take a little time and look at what happens over a shorter, a longer period of time to understand what does and what doesn't work in your uh, organization in terms of tactics and numbers. So when you're tracking those relationships, so say if I release a petition um, to call on um, less people to wear um, animal hats and more people to wear psychedelic ties in webinars, then um, I'm going to see how many people actually sign that petition. So if I'm getting 10,000 people sign it, then it seems like there's a lot of community energy out there around that. Um, but if I'm getting less people signing it, maybe animal hats are cooler than psychedelic ties in webinars. I just don't know. So um, look at the information as it comes in. Um, we really want to understand who is taking that action as well. So whether it be someone who is providing a donation uh, financial support to your organization, or if it's someone who's taking part in a tactic to progress you along your campaign strategy, you want to understand who those people are as well, because that information can help you guide what your next tactic might be. So if you had location data that um, a lot of people signed a uh, signed in Cairns to say that uh, animal hats were cooler than psychedelic ties in webinars up in the Cairns area, then I might think about doing some sort of on the ground or IRL event um, in Cairns, more than so in Melbourne where people wanted to do psychedelic ties in their, in their um, webinars, whatever. Anyway, I'm gonna stop that because it's just confusing me. So we wanna understand that information before we start to think about what tactics we're gonna do next in our strategy to make sure that we're not putting our, all of our energy into the wrong places. Just like um, with uh, our campaign strategy, we've always got goals as well. So some CRMs will allow you to track the number of people or to track goals or objectives that you might set in your database. For example, in Nation Builder, if you set a, a user pathway for someone, you can set goals for the number of people to complete that pathway. So it might be to move from signing a petition to donating to the organization. And you may have a series of steps that you wanna do in between that. So sending a couple of emails or maybe making a phone call. And as they progress through that and complete that step, you can do it. So you may have set yourself a goal of 200 donors from um, 10,000 petition signers. And you can track that and have goals and um, set metrics for your organization. But remember that we're dealing with people. So we don't always wanna set goals that are metric or numbers based because People are unpredictable and people also value uh, the approach that we take with them as well. So when you're setting goals or metrics, think about qualitative or like um, things that you've done that are value added to your organization beyond just pure numbers as well. So when we're um, doing uh, work in our database as well, there's um, an idea of like uh, sending out probes or testing how things might work. Um, and one of the great things you can do when you've got a CRM is to segment data and do a little bit of testing. So this is probably getting towards the higher end of complexity and also is very time consuming and will use a lot of labor. But some CRMs will allow you to do um, built into the um, capacity, what we call A-B testing. So where you can say, send an email and have a subject line um, that is open this email or we'll kill small puppies, which would be awful. Or you could have another one that says, um, please take action with us because you're wonderful people and see which one of those is more effective and gets more opens and then send it to the one that works. And who knows, sometimes you can trust your gut and just go with what you think will work, but sometimes the numbers will tell you differently. So being able to test and measure is really, really important in terms of deploying successful tactics that are based on real world evidence or an evidence based approach rather than one that is just based on your gut feeling and what you think might have worked last time. Go with the numbers, they're usually right. Um, and then, um, in terms of report, reporting as well, um, it's really helpful 
um, to set your CRM up and make sure that you are mapping out anything that you need in terms of your compliance and reporting. So if you're an incorporated entity, um, and I would check with um, each state's based laws, then you'll need to report to um, consumer affairs or whatever is the equivalent agency in your uh, district or area. So thinking about how can I make my database work for me in that sense? So what, what are the reports that I'm gonna to need to run and what sort of data points do I need to think about in order to run those reports to make sure that at the end of the financial year or in my reporting period, I'm able to run those reports and get that information easy. So you don't want this just to be set up in an arbitrary way that just works on campaigns. You don't want it just to work on uh, reporting and compliance as well, but you wanna find that happy marriage that makes it work for everyone in your organization and um, everyone will be much happier especially if you use Zapier I should get paid to do that Jeez, really ripping myself off do you want to talk about some of the um, CRM companies Glenn and let us know yeah what... so um, I just also want to talk about another metric when you're shortlisting your organize your companies that provide the software is um, yeah so not all companies are created equally so one point that you may look at is, is that company's ethics aligned with yours? So for example, Nation Builder um, famously quoted that they were proud to be a tool to get Trump elected, which was pretty bad approach to most of their target audiences left based. So um, is that ethics aligned with yours versus an organization like Action Network is actually set up as a not-for-profit um, and all the profits go back into the tool um, and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, and that one's a hard one because um, potentially a nation builder may be the right tool for you, but then you're sort of feeling a bit gross about the ethics. Again, we're talking earlier about a sophisticated compromise. Um, the viability of that company. So you may see a, a great new tool that's just come out. Um, will that company be in business in two years? Now, if you're doing all this work to actually um, set up your CRM and it's for the long term and then they go bust or they just make dumb decisions and um, make that tool really bad, um, you're stuck with it. Um, so it's important to have a look at, is that company viable? So an organization like Nation Builder, very financially successful, um, you know, you were pretty much guaranteed that they're going to be um, in the future around providing services. I'd be very surprised if that company went, went bust. Uh, an interesting one is age um, of the company. And in that context, there are a lot of older tools that um, are just a bit clunky. So in the context is if you are starting a CRM company, You'd go, how do I build with all the things you know and all the mistakes that others have made using modern approaches, the best CRM you can make? And so that'll probably be a bit buggy and not as many features, but it's going to be better written versus a really old system that may have been updated or may not have been. So I saw a client's website yesterday. They spent a lot of money on this outdated CRM. And I said, I could build that for you in WordPress in an hour. And they'd spent a lot of money on this system. Um, and it was just a really clunky, old fashioned way of doing it. So the company making this had developed this software many years ago and now just ride off it and just keep making money. And they're not actually updating the software. So an old company may be using the latest technology. They may be investing in updating their software. But the general approach, general thing what I see is usually if it's a really old system, it's generally old and clunky. And the open source CV CRM is a good example of that. Um, that's the best ethics I've ever come across. It's open source. However, it's just a bit too clunky for me to use. Um, and is the company actively developing it? Because, you know, the, this is just shifting so fast. Um, also the demographics and how we um, inter in interact and approach things. Um, so are they actively making this tool better? Um, new features, fixing bugs, um, new integrations, all that sort of stuff. And one of the key uh, drivers also is support. So these things are complex and you're going to need some help. And sometimes they're buggy or you just don't understand how to do something. So in that case, it's really important to have support. And I was talking to Phil earlier um, on Nation Builder example is that Phil was saying that they have really good support 
and they've actually hired Australian staff to support. So in that case, that's a positive. Because um, it's, it's likely, if not guaranteed, you're gonna need support and um, will they support you and will they look after you? Um, and also, will they actually give you smart answers? I've, I've been on tech support many times and the people on the other end know less about it than I do and um, they're not really helping me. Versus I've been with some other organizations and you've got some really smart techs that like, oh, teach me things on how to do it. And that's really what you want. So I've also, we're well, running um, a bit early on time. So I've got now a bonus section um, to talk to you about. And um, which, hang on, if it's, if I can get my browser to work properly. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about resistance to getting um, CRMs implemented or internal buy-in. And I wanted to talk about this because I've come across some weird things about why people don't want to do this. Um, why wouldn't you want an automated system that facilitates growth, increases revenue, uh, increases actions and helps you achieve your goals? <laughs> There's my sales bill. So um, one of the, I mean, this is interesting because when you're working with a group, different people will have different um, uh, positions and a lot of these are subconscious as well. So it's interesting to, when you're trying to present a case um, for a CM in your organization to sort of look at some of these issues. Um, one of the big bad ones is we're too busy. And I've got a friend that works in dog rescue and pretty much across the board, they run frighteningly inefficiently because they're too busy rescuing dogs to actually set up any systems for their efficiencies. And so in that case, they're just too busy. They're too busy saving the dogs um, to stop and actually um, put in systems or too busy fighting for the forest, that sort of thing. So in that context, that's something that um, we'd really want to prioritize the, the long-term growth. So sure, you're going to have one step back in your campaign, but then you're going to have three, four steps forward. So are you fighting just for this week to save the forest or are you fighting a long-term battle until you win? And if you're long-term until you win, then you want to take that step back, get your reinforcements um, and get ready for the next phase. Some people are scared of scale. They're like, I'm stressed out with this and um, I'm struggling with this and I actually don't want it to be any bigger. This is usually a subconscious um, resistance. Um, they're actually scared of the campaign getting big. Um, they're scared of the stress and they're also scared of um, losing control of um, like what this could become. Um, and in saying that though, databases help with that because it helps to efficiently scale and helps to in increase and improve the management of that scale. Um, some people don't understand efficiencies. So um, a lot of people work in corporate offices and they sort of use these sort of systems at work. So they sort of understand and that just makes sense to them. But other people have different life experiences and don't actually um, have ex uh, exposure to these sort of systems. So they don't understand the, the actual huge jump in efficiencies that they'll receive from this. So they're really skeptical of actually um, investing the time because they don't understand the, the huge wins that they'll get through this. Um, control issues is um, a subconscious one that a lot of people have. Like, um, they feel that they, um, by automating the systems, then other people will be controlling what they usually were in control of, and that they'll be losing control. And that's also linked to people who don't want to scale. So they're, they're just worried about that whole control thing. Now, control and power is always a discussion that should be had in organizing and especially in databases. And databases can do both. They can actually um, centralize and increase power um, and control. Um, they can also distribute um, control. So in that case, actually having control isn't so much the uh, issue, it's more how you're gonna implement and, and um, you know, design that within your database. Um, and some people actually don't want change. They're, um, you know, this is the way we've done it. We've been, we were campaigning in the 70s and um, this is the way we do it. We meet face to face and we do this. Um, and my point to that is like, I think the environment movement and social change movement has failed miserably today. We've had a few wins, we should celebrate them. It's awesome, but you know, we're losing more than we're winning. 
and we really need a change. We need to be desperate in figuring out how do we get better? How do we be more efficient? How do we scale this up? And another one that I've come across, and this again subconscious is people's ego. So in some inefficient systems, you've got one person that's really important to that running. Like they're the gatekeeper or they're the funnel and like everything needs to go past them for things to happen. And that's um, really um, part of their world and part of their identity. And they're really worried, this is subconsciously, that if, if you automate things, that they're no longer important. And my take on that is always, well, you've got more important things to do. Like you've got key skills and you're this important person. We need to be you more sophisticated doing what you do. And this admin -y stuff and should be moved over. Would you, um, Bess and Evan, um, <laughs> feel like to speak to that? I mean, what are some of the internal um, issues, buy-ins that you had and how did you overcome them? I've got stuff to add. You probably do too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, pretty much all those things in our case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we had to push for, for quite a while. And I think it's that thing, you know, everything is always so urgent um, with campaigns, you know, there's always something else that can be done, especially for us as an environmental center with a really broad spectrum, you know, we're just responding to a lot of local issues. And um, I think that's why it took us, um, it's taken us years to get to where we are today in terms of, getting a CRM and making all these changes and getting on your website. Um, I think as well, like making sure you're speaking the same language as, um, you know, the people that you're working with, whether that's your management committee or that sort of thing um, to make them. So they're on the same page as why, um, why it's so important. Um, we had similar issues, um, you know, with, with um, our organization in terms of people campaigning from the seventies because we've been around for 40 years. So um, we did have those same kind of sentiments. Um, oh, but we got a new website, um, you know, I think it was eight years ago. We don't need another one. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, you really got to connect people in with how tools can work um, and how they do work for other people to show them why it's so important. Um, but my main thing really, is just blocking out that time. If you don't block out that time to do the work, have people on board who are gonna do it and be really protective and savage with that time, it honestly will never, ever, ever happen. And it does take a long time. It's, there's no quick fix. You've got to plan for it and you've got to have that time to go. And um, yeah, I think as well, one final thing is just, um, really trying to make sure that people are all on board with you investing money in it as well, because it's also essential. Um, and probably talking in some of those labor terms like we were before might make sense to um, get other people on board in your group or organization. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, all of the things I can definitely relate with on um, many layers at different organizations. Um, Sometimes it's not right though for an organization to jump into a CRM, like, you know, and like not to think that like, you know, that this is a, a push. None of us are being sponsored by any of the companies that we mentioned, unfortunately. Um, but <laughs> that's right, you can sign me up and for cash for comment. No, I'm kidding. Um, but like, it is really important to like really understand it. Um, I know when I was talking to um, some people in an organization that I went, I was with around getting a CRM, um, it really helped um, to not use the um, uh, language of this or that, but rather <laughs> doing the um, and and um, as well. So when like you're talking about um, doing old school or older, more traditional campaigning techniques, it's like this means that we can do that and it values add its value adds to it as well. So like not setting up this kind of false dichotomy between um, the digital world and the real world, but rather than rather trying to find a um, kind of a conversation that happens between the two and really to understand that the flow happens between IRL and the digital world and that that's what these tools are actually like designed to do is to really help people because you can set up that supported network where you've got people who are stuck in the clickivism 
realm and those who um, maybe do things um, in real life, but actually they should be having conversations with each other and moving back and forth. Um, in terms of um, things around finances, um, I know um, that for, um, and I can say this freely, we, for Friends of the Earth, um, yeah, thank you, IRL in real life. I'm like getting all Gen Y. I just found out I was Gen Y. Um, even though I listen to Jesus and the Mary Chain, I'm pretty sure I'm Gen X. Anyway, um, the, the um, thinking about fundraising. So at Friends of the Earth, um, going into a CRM that allowed us to have monthly subscriptions um, as a part of our membership, so that like, you know, $10 a month and things like that has just made our fundraising go absolutely gangbusters. And um, our, the way that we um, would look at what, what are our most secure funding sources have changed significantly um, since um, getting a CRM that allowed us to do monthly subscriptions. Um, it is absolutely game changing. Um, also the ability to deploy digital um, tactics like uh, petitions with donation landing pages and thinking about like the complexity and the campaigning that you can do that you see the bigger organisations doing, having that, those tools accessible to grassroots and small organisations changes the playing field and like changes the resources that you're going to have uh, to do things with. So um, I, I think you can't undersell those um, financial and resource um, kind of um, capacities that can be brought through CRM. So, you know, keep up it if you've got resistance in your organisation. Where are we at, Glenn? Are there any other comments? I was going to do to to do a pitch for um, the other for the next webinar. Um, oh, we've got some some comments come in. So, other than patients, how do you help teams overcome these ego power dynamic issues? Um, I think that is um, people skills. Um, yeah, just for me, it's like identifying it and then maybe working out like if an individual's got an ego power issue like try to um, frame it so it's not a challenge to them. Um, so how can you frame it that this actually empowers them or will make them the hero of the story rather than this is actually going to make you irrelevant and is a challenge to you. Um, but without an actual specific sort of, you know, detailed examples, it's hard to talk specifically about, about that. Um, yeah, it's just more Making about- Making sure they're in the journey. Making sure they're on the journey with you, yeah. It's not like a separate thing and then they can feel like they're a part of it, but it is a complex one. Yeah, absolutely. I think you nail it on the head as well, Glenn, like it's about empowering them to see the opportunity for them and their campaigning style. Um, I found that really helpful to go like, oh, I've seen that you do this work, like, which is amazing. Did you know that this platform will help you do that? by X, Y, and Z features um, to do that as well. And then showing them how to do that early on. So they jump straight in and become one of the champions of using the system rather than um, someone who's um, doing the opposite. And that's a really sad comment by Ruben as saying that some orgs um, are abandoning um, membership structures because CRMs aren't doing it. I mean, membership structures are a great um, uh, approach um in in obviously depending on your strategy um, also there's some i mean there's interesting demographic data coming out around who are joining um organizations and basically the younger you're getting the less likely people are to become an active member of an organization but they can become active supporters so um i would say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and persist with the putting the square peg into the round hole of the, of the CRM to make your membership work and talk to other organizations as well. Like, because we all are having the same problems, but I don't think we're having really good inter um, organizational intercollective conversations about overcoming these hurdles and the fixes that you find um, that sometimes can work for other people as well. So find a friend. Uh, and Greg uh, mentioned that um, relearning is an essential skill and change increases the need for this. Um, pretty much my business model is about learning and selling the latest I've learned. Um, a lot of the skills that I've learned in my career um, are still relevant, but a lot of them just aren't. So if you've got someone who's been in the game three years, I've been in the game 20 years, like 
pretty much they can catch up and overtake me in a few years of knowledge. So uh, learning is just an essential thing. Like if you want to work with technology, you are dedicating yourself to a life of learning. Um, it's part of the game. And I think we should do that in life anyway. And especially as campaigners, because, you know, as I mentioned before, we're not winning and uh, we need to learn how to do that. Awesome. So um, on Friday, we've gone into a lot of the theory today, but on Friday, we're going to actually uh, open up actual Pacific systems. Um, so uh, Bess is going to be talking about um, Raisley and also Kepler, which is in the process of merging, which is an Australian based CRM, which um, is an exciting tool. Um, Phil will be talking about Nation Builder. And we've actually got uh, Ariane Stark, who's an actual proper um, consultant in this area. She works for Essential Media and deploys these systems for um, lots of NGOs. And she'll be talking about Action Network, which is the system I'm using. Uh, and we'll also be having David Paris just talk about a few other systems and um, a few other things around what we're doing. So it'll be a big session on Friday talking um, really the next level of choosing systems. And I've, we've chosen these systems because we feel that they're the most, most uh, used systems in Australia. Um, Action Network, I think, is the cheapest, most accessible um, through to Nation Builder, which is probably a lot more scale and powerful, maybe. Um, and there are Kepler sits in between. Um, so we do these webinars um, as pay as you feel. Um, so I've also in the email got a link to action skills, but I also added a link to CAFNEC and to Friends of the Earth. Um, they are always welcoming of donations as well. Um, and if donations um, aren't appropriate to where you are, because for us it's not about the money, um, liking um, our face, like liking our videos uh, on the YouTube, sharing on the social media um, and promoting what we're doing um, is very useful. And also to share amongst your other colleagues. So do what um, Bess and Phil have so great, uh, graciously done today is, is actually make time to help other activists to become better at what we do so that we can um, fight the good fights.